Hello, uh, everybody. Uh, we are very happy to be uh, with you live on uh, the uh, ESSEC uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I thank you first the uh, ESSEC uh, team. So the ESSEC, as a reminder, if needed, is one of the uh, leading business schools uh, in Europe. And uh, we are very happy to uh, jointly organize uh, the first uh, climate uh, talk virtual uh, for obvious reasons. Climate talk uh, organized by uh, the uh, ESSEC team uh, and focusing today on uh, the potentialities, the opportunities of EU and US cooperation regarding the climate agenda. Uh, you will have the, the opportunity to uh, ask questions uh, all over uh, this webinar. Uh, use the, the chat. Uh, room, I would say, of the, the YouTube channel, and then uh, I will receive the questions and I will, uh, of course, try to inject them into our uh, intense conversation. I'm very, very happy to uh, have uh, for this uh, webinar uh, four uh, key players, I would say, uh, on uh, this uh, the building of this uh, EU-US a new or renewed uh, green agenda. Uh, the first, and I will be, uh, as a mem member of the European Parliament, chairman of the uh, Environment Committee, uh, I will moderate uh, and uh, will uh, uh, also don't hesitate to uh, ask a direct question to our panelists to have direct answers and concrete answers uh, from uh, your side. So we have uh, today uh, Gina McCarthy. Uh, who, hi Gina, from uh, the US. Actually, I don't know exactly where you are, if it's Washington, New York, East Coast. I am in my home in Boston. Um, okay. And yes, that's where I am. Okay. So you serve uh, as the, the head of the uh, US uh, EPA, Environment, Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, so uh, under the Obama administration, you were one of the uh, just uh, top uh, person in charge of delivering uh, climate policies and, and, and climate goals. So of course, your analysis today uh, of uh, what you think might be done. And today, you, uh, you, you had, I would say, is the, the, the CEO of the uh, uh, Natural Resources Defense, Defense Council, NRDC, which is one of the, uh, I would say, uh, most influential uh, NGO uh, in uh, your community in the U.S. on uh, the green policy field. We like to think so, Pascal. Thanks. <laughs> uh, we have Andrew Steer. Andrew Steer is the uh, president and CEO of the WRI, World Resource Institute. Well, I used to collaborate to, um, with Andrew to the WRI. Uh, hello, Andrew. Uh, so you're based in Washington, I guess, in D.C.? Yes, indeed. Washington, D.C. For, for those who don't, who, don't know the value right, it is uh, usually ranked as the most influential think tank on uh, climate policies worldwide. So, again, it's very, very uh, interesting uh, to and valuable to have you here. We have also uh, Suzanne Zanger, uh, she's the CEO of uh, the American Chamber of Commerce to the EU. Hello, Suzanne. So, you are from Brussels uh, live. Uh, and uh, you, uh, with the um, uh, Amsham, you are working precisely on the relationship between the US and the EU, of course, with the angle of corporate. So that's a specific angle, but a very interest, interesting one. And uh, the last uh, speaker uh, will be Sedomir Nestorovic. Hi, Sedomir, uh, from Singapore. So thank you for being with us. Uh, it's uh, 11 something uh, close to midnight. Uh, so thank you for being with us, and uh, you are professor of geopolitics at uh, ESSEC Business School, uh, and you will provide also an insight from uh, the ASEAN, uh, would say, setting to complement uh, the, 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 the analysis from the US and the EU. So uh, as you can see, that could be uh, very, uh, very uh, insightful. I will organize the, the webinar into two parts. The first part will be uh, focusing on the domestic EU policies regarding uh, investment, finance, uh, infrastructure, recovery, uh, 
uh, industry, energy, sec uh, transport sector, and so on and so on. What can we expect from the new Biden administration? Uh, from the EU side, of course, uh, what can we expect? Um, and also, what is the what is the real possibility uh, for Biden to deliver, depending on the Senate, depending on maybe things you would like to bring precisely to uh, feed our analysis? Because the US has usually seen from the EU side as a, a sort of block, uh, focusing on Washington, D.C., and actually, the U.S. are much more diverse, much more diverse than that, than that. and that's why having your insight of uh, having a better understanding of this complexity is also very, very useful. Uh, we will have this first part uh, with Andrew and, and Gina to start with, and then the second part uh, will be focusing on the EU-U.S. relationship. So, what can we expect there? How we could build uh, and speed up. Uh, green transition. That's also where I could uh, bring uh, analysis from my own. Uh, and then we will have uh, Suzanne and Tedobien uh, to start with. And of course, all over again, your questions put on the chat. So let's start now uh, after this uh, introductory remarks. Uh, let's start with uh, uh, Andrew or, or Gina. Let's let this first. So, Gina, if you don't mind, Andrew, let's start with Gina. Uh, so, as I said, you were probably one of the key, maybe the, the, key, the key player under the Obama administration to deliver uh, the, the climate goals at that time. So what is your analysis of what we can expect when we read the, plan, the Biden platform? There are a, new, a lot of things, a lot of things that resonate with the EU Green Deal, even if the wording of the Green Deal, the framing, the phrasing is not exactly the same because the Green Deal expression in the US, let's say it's more radical and less mainstream than in the EU, but when you look at the content, it seems to me very close. So that's why it may be good to start with your analysis of the platform uh, first, uh, what are for you the key priorities, and then how, uh, the, how it could be delivered in the political context uh, by the group. Well, Pascal, first of all, thank you for inviting me and thanks everybody for joining. And I'm happy to be here with, with Andrew because um, he, he, no one bats clean up better than he does. So I'll, I'll make sure that I leave plenty of space for, for him. And, and thank you, Susan and Sedemir for, for uh, being here. So this, this is exciting for me. First of all, I feel like a, a little bit like a kid in a candy store. Uh, we're relieved of the burden of the prior administration, and we're all really looking forward to the transition um, to uh, President-elect um, Biden and, and Kamala Harris. Um, I, as many of you know, I worked for President Obama, but I also worked in the unity task force that, President, that, that the candidate uh, Biden uh, pulled together to try to make sure that we had a unified message on climate change. And that's been, I think, instrumental in the shaping of his plan uh, moving forward. His climate plan is really quite aggressive. In fact, the most aggressive of any candidate who's run uh, for, for president. Uh, uh, and so I'm, I'm really interested in, in talking to you about the potential of that plan to guide uh, what a Biden administration might do. First of all, he uh, established a couple of clear goals in his plan. He, he established a commitment uh, to pledge $2 million in strategic investments because he understood his build back better meant that we had to frame investments in a way that would look at the future. And his future is an envision to be built on a foundation of clean energy because clean energy is what brings jobs to the table. And as most of us know, Joe Biden is a labor person. He cares a lot about ensuring that the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy is made, but it's done in the most equitable way we can in a way that advances uh, both the issues of, of labor, uh, but also that pays attention to the equity challenges we're facing. I think as in all countries, COVID-19 has had a big impact. And on Joe Biden, it meant that he has a, a, an extreme sensitivity to the need to not just move clean energy, but to benefit 
some of the communities hottest hit by COVID-19, which in the U.S. are our black, our brown, our indigenous, and our low-income communities. That's where we need to invest. That's where jobs need to grow. And he's made a commitment that 40% of the investments that are made will be targeted to ensure that the communities left behind in COVID-19 and the communities that are hottest hit by climate in general are going to be the ones that receive that in investment moving forward so that jobs can continue to grow in the clean energy world. We're in the U.S. They've been growing a lot uh, prior to the pandemic. They were growing at a pace of three times as fast um, as the, certainly the fossil fuel sector, uh, but, but faster than the overall economy by almost double. And so we have a healthy base of, of opportunity to move clean energy forward. But, all, but obviously having a Biden administration in place allows EPA to be rebuilt. So it allows standards to be put in place as well. And we're looking probably at power plant emission regulations out of the gate. That means new standard set. Um, remarkably, even though the clean power plan that was rolled back that the Obama administration, myself, uh, signed um, to try to address the power plant emissions, remarkably, we achieved what we thought we could achieve in 2030 already, 11 years early. And that's because clean energy is so cost competitive. And a lot of that is built on the, the ground up from cities and states moving forward. They have not slowed down their pace. In fact, they've sped it up so that we now know that at least 29 states have sort of renewable energy standards. And we have many with with total clean energy standard goals, with looking at embracing the Paris commitments. And we're also looking at opportunities for cars and trucks again. As we know, California has been pushing the envelope. States are joining that in larger numbers than ever before. And we certainly expect that to be a sector that is regulated very quickly. So we're looking at a Biden plan that is centered on equity. We're looking at a Biden plan that focuses on standards and investments. And we are still looking at whether or not the Senate is going to be controlled by the Republicans or Democrats. And there is a uh, increasingly uh, more favorable look at this, at this landing potentially in the Democrats court. Uh, for, for many reasons. So we're pretty excited that we're well positioned. And, and while you may worry that Congress may not want to fund these issues, the one big shining thing for me in the Obama administration, uh, I'm sorry, the Biden administration approach is that they're looking at an all of government approach. The uh, budget uh, for the US in 2020, uh, the federal government budget, was $4.79 trillion. So if you look at that budget and you make decisions that aren't just about what standards can EPA put in place or what can I get from Congress, which we still think there's definitely going to be some stimulus and recovery dollars there, we can look at an all of government approach bringing considerable investment to the table. And if we look creatively at the powers of that money, and do it right, we can underpin and, and make the market shift to clean energy in the way that, that uh, the Biden plan has indicated. Now, you, you, thank you for, for, for this very clear setting. You mentioned uh, twice the clean energy. So the clean energy commitment, if my reading is correct, is clean energy 100% for power generation in 2035. That's correct. And then a net zero by 2050. Exactly. So there are two, uh, two obvious candidates for discussion. The first one is coal. The second one is natural gas. So what do you expect for coal and what do you expect for natural gas in the coming years? Well, I mean, we see that, that even under the Trump administration, which did everything they could to bend over backwards for coal to try to make it the fuel of choice, it's failed miserably. It is just, uh, it is in uh, its, its last stages of a transition. And so there's going to be a lot of discussion how to make sure that rural communities that rely on coal can transition elsewhere 
and that workers continue to find uh, a, a work to go to. But I have uh, the focus of attention now is very squarely on natural gas because there are more than 200 units of natural gas in the pipeline permitting. And I do think the conversation is going to quickly shift to how do we make the transition away from natural gas and do it in a way that clearly keeps reliability at the forefront, uh, but, but that gets us to that 2035 goal, which means there's gonna have to be some real reckoning with the utility world about how to expedite that transition and real conversations about whether you need to put new natural gas units in place while you're looking at a 2035 ele clean electricity goal. That to me is going to be a stretch of the imagination to think you can do both, uh, but that is going to be the strategy that this, that this incoming administration is going to have to clearly look through and work through with our utilities moving forward. Okay, uh, I, I try to, to cover uh, a couple of sectors, maybe, of course, Andrew, if you want to come back to this energy issue, of course, uh, feel free to do so. Another uh, sector you mentioned, uh, Gina, is about the car sector. Uh, in the, the car, the car the standard. Uh, yes. In the EU, uh, in June, there will be a new legislative proposal that uh, will put new CO2 standards in place that will have, as a consequence, that by 2035, yeah. it will be not, not possible to commercialize, to sell non-electric, non-hybrid cars. Yeah. So the, fa it's the phase out, the phasing in, and we stop, we intend to stop the new selling of uh, uh, fossil, I would say, fossil cars by 2035. Do you have that kind of agenda in the US? And of course, how we could cooperate and for, for car makers, that we get back to the, to the yeah. digital cooperation on the contrary clash for these global actors uh, in the second part of the, uh, the discussion. But fr from the US side, you have the same equivalent uh, vision? Well, th there wasn't any deadline set in the, the Biden plan itself. So let me talk a little bit about what the NGO community is, is pushing right now, because NRDC is working closely with Environmental Defense, EDF, um, as well as uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, UCS, and ICCT to look at how we start looking at some of the analysis that needs to be done. And even, you know, reaching out to the, the UAW, which is the big labor focus for us, United Auto Workers, to really start the conversation um, because we know that we, we are transitioning to electric vehicles. I don't think any, even any of the car makers can make the argument that that's not the future. Um, but the, the question also is, what do we do about trucks, which is a, a wholly different and, and challenging uh, world for us to look in, which may open up real opportunities for green hydrogen. So there are lots of opportunities. And, and the issue really, Pascal, isn't whether that transition is happening, because it already is. You can see it, and we have even GM is now talking about the need to make that transition. But, but it's really getting the infrastructure built to support that, getting the cost down and the incentives for manufacturing up and making sure that, that the labor community continues to really uh, invest, be invested in, in the United States so we can be managing and, and manufacturing more of the products that we are, we are recognizing are going to be dominating the market. So it's about building the manufacturing sector here. So again, it's going to be standard setting, I'm quite sure. And I think we have lots of opportunity to do that, but it also has to be married about a strategy on who wins and who loses and how do we invest in the infrastructure? Because electric vehicles cannot just be available for those of means. They have to become much more readily available and inexpensive as time goes on so that everybody can avail themselves of this. But it will have tremendous health and worker benefits. 
Um, I mean, the, the richness of these strategies, Pascal, as you know, is that it's not just going to stabilize the planet. We are talking about real opportunity for real human beings to breathe healthy air and have jobs of the future instead of trying to pigeonhole old ideas and make them work for today, which clearly did not work for the Trump administration and is not going to be the downfall of the Biden-Harris administration. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Gina. We will come back to you uh, a bit later on. Uh, let's move to uh, Andrew. Uh, so, Andrew, for WRI, uh, more or less the same question to start with, then, uh, Gina. What, what, what is your analysis of, of the platform and what could we uh, expect as the, the, the key next steps regarding, for instance, uh, the, the next recovery stimulus package that would be probably the first uh, milestone? Great. Well, thank you, Pascal. It is a pleasure to see you again and to be here. Uh, I remember when you were not only Minister of Climate, but also Minister of Development. And I always thought that was the most wonderful model to have somebody that's thinking about economic development and climate. And that's exactly what we need to focus on. And, and also congratulations to all. I know there are a number of Euro MPs in, in the audience. Uh, congratulations on what you guys are trying to do. Um, it's really impressive. We need your leadership. So Thank you very much indeed. And so I think both Gina and I are delighted to be here. Um, but we do recognize you guys are doing some remarkable things and we need to learn from each other, so to speak. It's a great honor to follow Gina. I hope everybody knows she's one of the most famous and most admired heads of the EPA in the history of this country. And the reason for that is she had a, she had a pretty hostile Senate herself and she had to sort of navigate in a truly brilliant way, using some of the best legal minds to make sure that she could put in place uh, under the Obama administration what needs to be done. And my goodness me, we may need that more now. So uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to, to follow uh, Gina. Look, these are fantastic days uh, for the United States and climate. We've been in a dark winter for the last four years. At the federal level, it has been simply dreadful. Now, as Gina said, one of the great inventions um, in, in civilization was the American Constitution, because it, it, prevents, it prevents a man like Mr. Trump doing as much damage as, as he might have done. Um, Congress matters a lot, and subnational levels of government matter a lot. And so if you actually look at the United States from outside, the last four years looks dreadful, because Mr. Trump obviously was in charge of the international agenda. If you actually look at the numbers over the last four years, it's not quite as bad uh, as it sounds, as Gina said. Now, as, um, as Gina said, you know, Mr. Tr Mr. Biden has the most ambitious climate plan in the history of the United States. The question is, what would that mean in the coming year as they put together their NDC, um, their nationally determined um, contribution? We've done lots of work on that, and the transition team is obviously working on it. They haven't said what their goal for 2030 will be, because that takes a lot of work. And quite frankly, it also depends quite a bit on what kind of authority they have, what happens to the Senate uh, runoff elections in Georgia in, in January, of course. Our analysis and, the, and that of others suggests that the United States could make a commitment to lower its emissions uh, by uh, between 45 and 50 percent by 2030. Now, put that in, in, in perspective, and remember, without wanting to get too technical, the United States uses a base of 2005, whilst Europe uses one of 1990. So, so if it's supposed they were to come up with 50 percent, we believe that would be good for the economy, even in the short term. We think there's lots of evidence, as Gina said, that actually smart climate action will lead to actually better jobs. Smart climate action, as uh, you've said many times yourself, Pascal, leads to more economic efficiency, it drives new technology, and it lowers risks. And those three things together lead to actually more investment, better jobs. So we actually think the 50% is possible. If you put that on a 1990 base, that would be about 45, 46%. Compare that to what Europe is considering, which is 55 to 60 percent by 2030. Uh, the United uh, Kingdom just came out with 68 percent last year, last week. So, so in other words, uh, we've got a little bit of catch up to do, but it's still a very, very serious possibility that this decade the United States will once again domestically become a real leader. 
Now, uh, and Mr. Biden has the authority. Uh, he has the mandate. Um, he, he, uh, he, he won the election by six million votes, remember? Um, he earned 13 million more votes than Hillary Clinton got. Now, having said that, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Trump uh, had 72 million people voting for him, and he earned 10 million more votes than he earned four years ago. So, you know, the battle is not over. And Mr. Trump may well announce that he's going to run four years from now as well. And as Gina said, uh, you know, there is a real possibility now that the Democrats could win both Senate seats in Georgia. It's still not a likelihood, quite frankly. And so it will be quite challenging should the Senate stay in the Republican hands. Um, if that happens, Mr. Biden will be the first Democratic president since 1886 that takes office without having a majority in the Senate. So that indicates a little bit that he would have a bit of an uphill battle to go. But as Gina demonstrated four, four years ago under, uh, under the Obama regime, even if you don't have the Senate, you can do some very imaginative things. Well, pre precisely, Andrew, if I may uh, jump in. So what could be done on the regulatory agenda, like uh, standards for uh, energy efficiency for cars or for coal, so on? I think it's something that was already more or less experienced before under the uh, GINA leadership uh, with the Obama administration. But regarding two issues uh, we already mentioned, I, I would like to know more about what is feasible in the case the Senate remains Republican. Okay, if the Senate uh, switched, then there is no issue anymore. But if it remains Republican, what about the NDC and the targets you just mentioned? Do they have to pass through the Senate? And if yes, what does it mean? No, the, the NDC does not have to pass through the Senate any more than the Paris uh, deal has to pass through the Senate. Yeah. Um, uh, Europeans wanted the Paris deal to be a global treaty. And most countries did not, including the United States. And so, um, uh, so that, that doesn't need to pass through. They can, Mr. Biden can announce whatever goals he has. And he has, we believe, um, enough um, levers to pull that could enable him to get to 45 to 50%. Now, I would, I would go one step further, which is even although a Republican Senate is actually quite hostile to anything relating to carbon targets or anything, there are quite a few areas where actually uh, the cross aisle, as it's called, relationship could actually lead to productive deals. And many people regard Mr. Biden as almost like a Lyndon Johnson, you know, a, a man of the Senate, he can put his arm around uh, people in the other party and sort of come alongside them. Now, that's going to be hard to do. But there are a number of areas where it looks like bipartisan support would be possible. One is in um, research and development, in new technologies, whether it's hydrogen, whether it's carbon capture and storage, um, whether it's battery storage, for example. Another is methane, which is a huge problem. It looks like, um, uh, well, it, it's not entirely clear what they could do on, on methane, but certainly on uh, HFCs, it looks like there's a possibility for bipartisan support there. So, so it's, not going to be, um, it's not going to be easy but, um, but, but there will be some issues that he could take through the Congress, we believe. But then, okay. even if he gets no support in the Congress, he still, of course, has the so-called executive authority. Now, it's more difficult now because of the composition of the Supreme Court. And actually, it'd be really interesting to hear from Gina. Um, uh, had, had the Supreme Court had the composition it has now when she was a head of EPA, you know, would she have had to design the clean power plan a little bit differently because, you know, she's not going to have a, basically a favorable approach. Um, until recently, the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, you know, had actually a very enlightened view on climate regarding uh, carbon as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act, which was a, a very wonderful decision that Gina certainly is very central to. <clears throat> okay. Gina, do you want to, to answer quickly to the uh, Andrew's point? 
Yeah, sure. I, you know, I don't think that the Supreme Court, even in its current makeup, will reverse that. We did not have a friendly court even when the, the litigation of Mass versus EPA actually made the determination that you could regulate under the Clean Air Act and should if carbon was causing a, a danger to human health or well-being. And that, that decision was made. I think the challenge is going to be uh, basically moving forward within the framework of the law as tightly as you can to get the kind of reductions you actually want to achieve. You know, we had to be a bit creative in some venues, like the Clean Power Plan, in order to get more than 1% at high cost, which is what this administration decided was the favorable approach. So we will have to, the, the, the EPA will have to move carefully, but I don't think that's the only tool available under executive order. There are many opportunities that will be very solid. And one of the opportunities that, that Trump opened up was that you can think creatively about your budget. <laughs> you know, we spend a lot of money uh, on already traditional fossil fuel responses. We give a lot of money to fossil fuel companies that we should not. We have an ability to actually promote new types of housing if we do it correctly, which is moving us towards all electric. So we have and we also have partnerships that are being being implemented across different regions of the country on on infrastructure for electric vehicles that don't need wow. any intervention at the federal level. And so we have lots of opportunity. I, I think that's exactly right. I think the the I mean, if you look at the the so-called building back better theme, I mean, it, it really would be transformative. I mean, the United States Congress to date has made $3 trillion available. Basically, almost hardly a dollar, you could say, is really heading towards sort of a green future. It's heading towards yesterday's economy, not tomorrow's economy. What Mr. Biden has done um, is, is laid out a plan that actually is pretty, um, pretty dramatic in terms of allocating the, the next trillion or two to, um, to tomorrow's greener, more inclusive economy. And it's really important to, to reinforce the point that, that Gina made, which Europe also makes, which is um, this is not yesterday's environmentalism. This is the people's environmentalism. This is, this is you know, the just transition means something to Mr. Biden. And just as in the green European deal, you know, that's a central theme. But Mr. Biden, that is going to be very, very central. And that means, for example, that uh, issues like border adjustment taxes um, are going to become a real feature potentially. Why? Because you've got to protect your domestic industry, and and we're going to see some very interesting debates on that. I suggest we put this this uh, theme, which is a very important one for the second part about the trade. Uh, but uh, we will get back to that. My last question to you, Andrew, uh, before moving to the second part of the webinar, is. So you referred a couple of times to the, uh, the, the recovery package or the new investment bill or the stimulus package. I, I, I can't remember exactly how you said it's phrased. Mm -hmm. In Europe, we have the recovery plan. It's uh, 700 billion. And we are still negotiating it for the, this week. I'm part of the negotiating team on the green side. And what we will get is between 37% and 40% of the whole package so 225 billion, 250 billion to finance green investment, which is probably one of the largest shock of uh, green investments for the next three years uh, globally. We have this uh, benchmark in mind. So as you put your own benchmark for the, the NDC, the US NDC with the minus 55, minus 50, what would be your benchmark to assess the next green stimulus package from the Biden administration? What would be uh, the key factor where you will say, well, that's, that's the big one? Well, from what we understand, Mr. Biden would want to do, you know, roughly what Europe is trying to do in terms of percentage. But what we have to remember is he, this is something he has to get through the, uh, the Congress. So, so the budget does need to be approved. He doesn't have the authority. He, he proposes but Congress disposes. And so that's why the, 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 the elections in January are so very important in, in Georgia. So, so um, we, we can't guarantee that what he wants, um, 
he will get. Having said that, as you know, I mean, he's putting together a superb team, doing it in a very interesting way where he's putting really, truly enlightened people on this subject of climate change and sustainability in very, very high places. So Janet Yellen, the, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, she's not just a truly brilliant economist having run the Fed and so on, but she was a founding member of the Climate Leadership uh, Coalition, which, uh, which uh, lobbies Congress on having, um, on having a, a, a carbon tax. I've been to uh, senators with her, and I think Gina has too, in that context before she was appointed several months ago, um, uh, where she is arguing before Congress um, that we need a carbon tax. Um, uh, and, and so you've got people like that that actually believe that. So there's certainly, I think the Biden administration is gonna be very well equipped as it goes to um, the Senate and the, the House to negotiate a budget. But at the end of the day, it does have to be agreed by them. Okay, the, maybe the last word for the first part, Gina, on the, the economic stimulus and what would be your, the, the key priorities to you? Uh, you know, honestly, I think that, that uh, President Biden is smart enough to recognize that, that a stimulus or recovery bill has to be very much talked about as a way to, to stabilize and strengthen the economy and grow jobs. And so I think the messaging is, is very likely to be all about green jobs, um, all about clean energy, um, because frankly, that is where the job growth opportunities are. And so really, the, I think the, the drama around this is just making sure that, that in areas where the communities rely on fossil fuels, how do we get them to a position of being, being an, uh, an opportunity state for clean energy? And so we have to make that transition. But, uh, but everything Andrew says is correct. The, the other thing that I would point out is that, you know, he picked John Kerry to do all of the international work around this. And as you probably know, he's no shrinking violet on the issue of climate change. Uh, it, he, he gets it and he's going to push as hard as he can, but I think he's also going to push you know, the Biden administration and push us domestically to be as strong as we can on our NDC commitment, because that is going to give him leverage. And, and you know, I, I know that I've been in government my whole life until I'm at a nonprofit, which is pretty close to being in government. I get it. And I know that we're talking to a private sector audience. But as a good regulator, I know that the job of government is to send signals. And you do it in a couple of different ways, by what you say you don't want and by what you say you do. And he is going to use both of those opportunities equally. He's going to use standards to get rid of pollution we don't want, but he's also, I think, going to be the president that, that finally makes us understand that the future we want is the future, not just to fix a problem, but to lead us into the next century. And if the US doesn't get this now, then we're in sad shape because I actually think we do. And I'm with Andrew, he's putting the leadership in place that get this and are going to move it, not standing on the platform of saving the planet, but standing on the platform is, do you, do you want to lead healthy, productive lives? Do you want to have good jobs? Do you want to get paid a living wage? And do you want to also hand your children a good future? If those are the only questions you answer, and that's the only framing, I will be a very happy woman. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gina. And we, so we move to the uh, second part of the webinar. Uh, and starting with Susan, uh, ladies first again, uh, with the, so the more the international part, I would say where the cooperation uh, between the EU and the US could uh, speed up uh, the transition. So uh, your vision, uh, Suzanne, from the uh, corporate angle, what, what do you expect? What, what, is your, what are your needs? Uh, and what would be to your view on the contrary uh, uh, routes that would raise some uh, problems for your members? Thank you very much, Pascal. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this webinar today with such illustrious uh, panelists. Um, great to see you all there. And 
just to say, if I may, just to kick off, indeed, who we are, we represent here at AmCHMU in Brussels over 160 US companies and what we say they're committed to invested in Europe. So the perspective that I'll be giving today is definitely from this, this side of the Atlantic, um, but saying that it has many similarities, probably also just to point out for our listeners that we're actually a non-partisan organization. So um, just, just to make that, that really clear in the, in the current environment. But I um, want to say it's, a, it's always a pleasure to work with the European Parliament. The Parliament's an absolutely vital partner for us. So we look forward to that cooperation going, going forward, Pascal, with the committee there. Um, if, just, to, just to kick off a little bit on international cooperation, I mean, firstly, just to say that US companies in Europe are absolutely committed to the Paris Agreement. So, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that. that. That's the first thing and the goals of the EU Green Deal. And just to pick up on something that Gina said there, I think her last comments about making sure that any green plans uh, to achieving climate change has got to be linked to the economy. And um, I'm sure, I don't know, our listeners, certainly those on this side of the Atlantic will know that the EU's economic recovery plan that's come out recently is extremely ambitious. We totally support that. And it's two main pillars of that economic recovery plan are green and digital. They've committed to 20% of the entire black plan being committed to uh, green investment. So we totally support that. That is the way to the future. We'll, we'll come to some jobs in a minute. Um, I also think just to pick up as well on international cooperation, you know, the Paris Agreement, yeah, we, we look forward to, we hope, the US joining again under Biden's administration. I think from the corporate perspective, let's not forget that companies have been continuing. There's been no, just because the US pulled out of Paris uh, four years ago. That doesn't mean to say that companies have not been doing anything. They have indeed. They have been investing and they have been innovating all this all this while to reduce their carbon footprints. So I think that's a very important point to make. It doesn't stop whether you're in Paris or not. Obviously, it's better that we're in. And we do need international cooperation to achieve climate goals. That goes without saying. And we need EUS cooperation. Um, Green investing in green technologies is absolutely key. I'll explain why that's important for business in the moment. But very much, I just sort of point back to that. I wanted to point out the EU's recovery plan. So just a little bit on the in, in the cooperation front, moving forward on that. Yeah, we've seen a change in tone already. We welcome that. This is going to be absolutely important. There's renewed enthusiasm. There is certainly hope and there's certainly some optimism. And we would say, and also as business and the EU, we would identify climate as one area for potential cooperation going forward. There are others as an organization, artificial intelligence, WTO, all those good things in trade, but certainly uh, climate is important. As, as the previous speakers have said, the perspective from this side, Pascal, is that we foresee President-elect Biden looking at domestic issues first. So there's no, not gonna be some magic transformation. We're, we're very realistic about that. There are going to be stress points that remain in the overall organ um, relationship, but climate is one where we see it, um, you know, it's an opportunity going forward, um, particularly in the pandemic. Actually, I don't think we've mentioned the pandemic yet, but I think also it's been seen, and certainly the EU stance is that working on climate, working on solutions is a way to help come out of this pandemic um, to drive forward the economic recovery. And with that, we would also very much stress that jobs are key. You have to put an emphasis on jobs. Why is it, this is not just for, um, this is for the environment, but it also, you've got to bring people along with you. It is no good if you do not bring everyone along, along with you. Um, I think I would just make, maybe mention on the, the international cooperation, EU and US, we see ourselves as like-minded partners on many things. There needs to be leadership now. We do need EU-US leadership going forward. Um, perhaps uh, Sedamir might comment on China. Uh, this, this is key. So we do need to work together. Um, and we're so looking forward to that. Um, it would be a very strong signal indeed if the US does and President -elect Biden does sign up to Paris uh, when after inauguration. However, that's just one thing. That, that's, not going to, that's not going to solve everything. He's got these domestic issues to deal with. I'm going to give you some numbers, actually, if I may. Um, because it's investment that counts to business. It's um, You can have targets, but it's about how you get to the targets. But investment is absolutely crucial. But going back to the fact the US and companies have actually been continuing on the line, I've got a figure here. Since 2007, US companies have actually been responsible for more than half of the long-term energy 
agreements in Europe. That was a figure from 2019. So that's absolutely huge. So again, in case anyone thinks it's not everything stopped, it has not. Another one, which is uh, to show how important it is for us to collaborate and how good the relationship is, US companies actually account for four of the top five purchases of solar and wind capacity in Europe. So that's four of the top five. And then if we have a figure going the other way around, because this relationship is, goes the other way too, European companies have been amongst the largest investors in energy related industries in the US with 779 greenfield project investments in the US energy economy. So you can see how intertwined we are and I think we need to build, we need to build on that. Uh, and, and so maybe just finally, investment's the way forward, Pascal, for, for business. It's got to be way, the way forward. Um, we, you know, we're hoping that the Biden administration will take inspiration for everything that's been done before. But companies play a crucial role in relaunching this. But we've got to put the emphasis on now fostering innovation. So anything that governments can do, parliament can do, uh, develop cutting edge, te edge technologies. We've got the technology now. We, we've got to invest going forward on further technologies to continue to build build this but crucially investment takes time so what business needs is stability and certainty they work on long-term cycles so it's may, needs to we need to make sure now that okay there are targets we need to understand how we're going to reach those targets what are the measures that accompany those targets uh, and how long is that going to take and, and make it stable and certain so companies can invest and with that the, yes international cooperation is absolutely vital to set a global playing field on this Thank you. Uh, maybe one question on the, uh, the, the finance sector. Um, you might know that uh, the green finance uh, agenda has moved forward a lot uh, in the EU over the last, let's say, three, four years. Uh, the issuance of green bonds, uh, whether we talk from corporates or sovereign green bonds, and by the way, next year, the European Union or the Commission as a, as a body will be the, by far the largest emitter, issue, issuer sorry, of green bonds uh, by next year, starting from zero, thanks to the uh, recovery plan. We have put together a, a definition of what is green and non-green on uh, financial markets, so that we have a harmonized way to define what is green and not all over European financial markets. And a last example, would be the European Central Bank, where Christine Lagarde has already said that by next year, it will review uh, the doctrine of the Central Bank in order to make the difference between uh, carbon intensive asset and low carbon asset in the purchasing and selling uh, policies of the bank. On all of that, my gut feeling is that the US at that stage, at that stage are lagging behind. So what's your view on how we could, uh, 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 from the US side, speed up things and how we could, from the EU side, also helping transferring this energy we have, whether we talk about financial markets, uh, monetary policies, or uh, uh, lending policy? Susan, Susan. Yeah, yeah, well, I think, I mean, I can't, again, Pascal, I can't perhaps comment you're on muted. what the, you're oh. Muted, I think oh, I should be off. Can you hear me now? I yes. It says I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? I can. No. I can hear you. Uh, yeah, it says I'm unmuted. You can hear me, said Amir. Can you? Can you hear Susan? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, I, I can hear. <laughs> oh, everyone else can hear me. Sorry, Pascal. Uh, well, <laughs> that's, no, let, that's let, let, if, some, if everybody can. Yes, Suzanne, uh, Suzanne, keep on moving. And I'll I'm not sure I've got so much to say on this, but I'll carry on talking and hopefully um, Pascal can lip read. Um, so just to say, I'll I mean, maybe leave um, Gina and Andrew to comment on what the US needs to do, perhaps on, on finance. Indeed, I believe that the EU is, has made great progress on this um, with regard to sustainable ah. finance. You can hear me now. You can hear me? No, oh, I'll, I don't know whether to... I'll, um, I can't hear, I can't hear, um, Pascal, I, shall I carry on talking or wait? Um, yeah, you keep going. I'll take the initiative and keep work walking. Andrew, you can help out and, uh, Gina on this, on the finance, but, um, 
the taxonomy, this, this word in the EU uh, taxonomy has been done, which is basically uh, in, very important to business, is, in, is to understand well, what constitutes a green investment, um, because sustainable finance is, is now key. But until we understand, well, what will, if there's going to be more investment in green, first of all, we have to identify what, what, what is considered a green investment. So that's really important. That, that has now been done. Um, so we've, we as business have been just been calling on the EU to put a greater focus on investment in general. Like I said, I think the, the important thing is um, we would support the green investment and many of our companies are doing a lot of this. We've got some stories up as well, Pascal. You can hear me now. So yes, I, I can. No, Sorry, I was uh, disconnected uh, on the other. I don't know why. Um, okay. I mean, but maybe on, on sort of you're talking about finance. I am mean, just saying that we're totally supportive of what the EU is doing on defining the taxonomy of what constitutes a green investment because we need business needs clarity. Um, we do, there's a big banking sector as well. They need clarity. They're very supportive of this. Perhaps just on another aspect, you know, not connected to that, but on finance, I think also what we are very clear on where, where we need global cooperation is on carbon pricing that hasn't been brought up yet. You know, the the listeners may be aware that there is the ETS, the emissions trading system underway in Europe. But we do think that there's a role for sort of, you know, we need a level playing field so that the more that we can al be aligned, the better and the better it is for, for, for companies, the more climate policy can be aligned. So, so on this, this topic of the carbon price and maybe also for Andrew to comment on the uh, engineer on the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism as well and, and trade policy as a whole. So okay. We, we have a carbon price. You don't. Uh, we are going to have a rising carbon price because the, the, the new target now is around 50 euros. And then in order to have a level playing field, we will have a carbon border adjustment mechanism that will be introduced in June 21 for implementation in January 23 at the latest. That's the political deal we have with the Council and the Commission. So how do you see the role of EU-US cooperation in that context where it's as Andrew said, it's in the Biden platform, but it's just an idea for the time being. When we, as we talked, you still don't have any carbon price at the federal national level. We do, and we have it rising. So how do we manage and handle this, which is apparently a, a potential contradiction between the, the two sides? Maybe Suzanne to start with, and then Andrew and, and, and Jill. Uh, all right. So that was a question for Andrew. I'll comment on the um, the, the potential CBAM, Pascal. I'll maybe I'll make a comment on that. Um, it's still very uh, so CBAM, as we call it here in Europe, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is a new proposal. Uh, still quite early in the process, as you said. So we've as business, we've input into the consultation process, um, you know, completely recognizing this challenge that the challenge of maintaining competitiveness of manufacturing. So for business manufacturing, in jurisdictions with strong climate ambitions, such as the EU. So for some of our companies, they are manufacturing in the EU. Um, for some of our companies, they're not only manufacturing the EU, they may be manufacturing outside the EU and then importing in, maybe they're importing in part. So it impacts absolutely everybody. Um, but what's a challenge is this an absence of a equivalent measures um, in these jurisdictions, it it's gonna, it's not gonna help competitiveness. So. It, this the C, the it's good in principle. We would support it in principle, as long as it is WTO compatible, as long as it does not disrupt supply chains, for which it has the potential to disrupt them if it's not, and, and lead to tr more trade conflicts if it's not managed um, again in an international way. So again, it's indeed a, a completely great example of where we do need international cooperation. Andrew. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is a there is a huge shift in thinking in the economics profession about this. I mean, even five years ago, overwhelming uh, sort of majority of uh, trade economists would have been opposed to such methods. And um, now there's a recognition that they can play a role. I think Susan is dead right that, you know, done wrong, they can be very disruptive and they can get in the way of trade. Done right, they can start creating, um, uh, if you like, a, a, a carbon market globally. Now, it is important to recognize it's not just comparing carbon tax with carbon tax. So, for example, what you said, Pascal, you know, we have a tax on carbon, you don't. What Gina did in the clean power plant thing effectively put equivalent to a price on carbon. 
essentially by lowering the uh, carbon intensity of production of electricity, for example. So what you can do is you can, you can adjust these based upon the carbon intensity of production, or you can, you can set them according to actual taxes need to be e e equilibrated. So there, there are different approaches. I mean, the exciting thing would be essentially a C3, um, Europe, United States, China saying, look, we all have got goals to go to net zero. We all have ambitious NDCs. Let's talk about trade and then bring in, I mean, it's very exciting. Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala looks like she will become the head of the World Trade Organization. How cool that would be. She currently is co-chair of the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate, uh, committed to free trade, committed to uh, economic efficiency, um, committed to jobs, but also committed to the environment. So, um, so this could be a quite exciting times, I believe. Okay, Jeanette? I think I'll leave it at, at that. Andrew do covered everything. I'm just very excited that Andrew looks so excited. You have no <laughs> idea. We, we, we feel like little kids again. Uh, we're being... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so we will be the usual uh, European grand grandparents. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll be, of course, on, on this uh, topic. Uh, uh, I will be part of the negotiation and we have already starting the design of it in the EU. And as uh, Suzanne said, having it WTO compatible is, is a red line. So if it's not WTO compatible, there will be no majority to pass it because then we will enter into a non-cooperative territory, which is not what we want. So what we want to design, and we consider that there is space to design something which is WTO compatible. So we'll be more than happy to cooperate with the, the three of you later on on this uh, very specific topic. So now I will give the floor to, to Selomir uh, to have uh, comments and analysis. So you are not a political actor, you are not an NGO, you are a professor and academic. So maybe you could also uh, help us to have a, 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 a zoom back and uh, making the analysis from, the, from Singapore where you are based uh, from uh, Asia. What does it make sense for you in that conversation? And how you see China, India and other uh, Asian powers in that context? Thank you, Pascal, and thank you to all of you. It was uh, wonderful to listen to you. Uh, I am a professor in a business school, um, and the school is a French school. Uh, we have a campus here in Singapore. ESSEC Business School is uh, uh, catering to all students, uh, starting, let's say, at 17 years old and going up to the executive MBA. So we have a huge, uh, let's say, variety of students coming there. And uh, obviously, we have observed among them a very keen interest in everything which is pertaining to climate change. Because we are talking about that, but in fact, we are talking about their future. And the future of our students is what is driving us in order to uh, have uh, lectures, in order to have guest speakers, in order to have topics uh, that we are forcing them uh, to talk about, even if maybe they did not imagine to talk about this. So it means that in the school, even if it is a business school, of course, business is one important element, but we live in a world which is evolving. So we also have to express what is evolving there. And they're extremely uh, concerned with the climate change. And within the school, we also recognize this with various initiatives that we have within the school and also with our partners. Now, Concerning uh, the different elements that you have mentioned here, and especially from the Asian perspective, uh, of course, we are excited. Uh, a new era is coming. But the problem is to know, uh, is uh, it really a priority uh, for the decision makers? And uh, this is where we have a problem, because uh, we can have a lot of uh, different other priorities. And uh, from the Asian perspective, especially if I'm going back to what Susan has indicated about the importance of the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has changed fundamentally elements uh, because we are thinking about what is essential and what is not. So maybe in the past, the climate change for many businesses was not essential. Maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, they were only looking at profits, they were only looking at 
increasing the market shares or whatever. And if they are not forced by the legislative part in order to invest in some green technologies, they wouldn't do it because they didn't find any interest in doing it. Today, with the pandemic, we have completely different things. So all the companies that we are talking to, all the decision makers that we are talking to, they are all convinced now about the climate change because they realize that it is essential. In the past, they were thinking that's good to have, but now they are thinking that it is essential. I think that from the political point of view, this is a radical change. And it is, hap it is happening in all domains. For instance, here in Asia, we have uh, initiatives which are coming from investment funds and also coming from the sovereign funds. Usually, we are referring to the Norwegian uh, in, uh, sovereign fund as the best one in green technologies, whatever. This is no more the case. Now, all the sovereign funds, all the investment funds, I'm thinking about that. Here in Asia, there is the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change, 49 participants. They are talking about 11 trillion US dollars. 11 trillion US dollars. This is not a small amount. In all other countries, we can talk about 1 trillion, 2 trillions. Here it is 11 trillion dollars. So it means that banks, investment funds, and sovereign funds have realized that it is not only important, but it can also be profitable. And when you tell them that it is profitable, everyone listens to you <laughs> because they are saying it is not only something that doing good for the planet, doing good for the society, whatever, it is also good for the company. <laughs> and if it is good for the company, they will say, let's look at it. So when Susan is talking about uh, uh, the involvement of different companies, of course, at the beginning, maybe they have been pushed by the law, by the uh, lobbying or whatever political parties, but now they are doing it on their own. We have uh, many webinars, we have many discussions with the private companies here in, uh, in Asia. And uh, it, it is remarkable to see what was the shift before the pandemic and after the pandemic. So I think that the pandemic has done a great uh, influence on the evolution of the mentality of people, what is essential, because you are talking about life and death. And the pandemic has introduced this notion about life and death in many minds, in young minds, in older minds, in everyone. So now they are talking about this from this perspective. So obviously, this has changed. Asia has changed. Everyone is involved there. When we are looking at the different countries, I will go back to what Andrew has said. There is a triptych. The triptych is US, European Union, China. That's it. So, of course, we have other countries. We have India, we have Japan, we have all the other countries. But in fact, China is the most important one here in Asia. So if they can work together, all the better. If they cannot work together, that poses a problem. <laughs> so in that case, we have to imagine something else. I will stop here for the moment. I will listen to Pascal if you can give me some other questions or the other participants exactly. to the webinar. <laughs> Actually, I, I, we have questions, and maybe if you don't mind, I, I will in the remaining uh, seven minutes. Uh, we I will focus the two questions on Gina and Andrew uh, for the U.S. side. Uh, the first question is: It will be completely the transition with your uh, last uh, uh, mention of China. Uh, you know, the China was on the U.S. Uh, uh, political agenda of tr the Trump narrative and so on, China was very high. Uh, so how do you see uh, the G2 on China, between China and the US uh, happening again? I was part of the uh, preparation of the Paris deal. Uh, Andrew knows that by heart. And we all know that the, the defining moment was the G2 a year, a year before the Paris Agreement between Obama and the Chinese leadership. Uh, so what's your view on this, uh, bo both of you? And the, the, the last question, it will also be said, it's also sent by, by the, the audience. It's about one sector we haven't uh, touched, upon, touched upon at all, which is the buildings. So we mentioned cars, finance, trade, uh, energy, but we didn't mention buildings, buildings efficiency. 
which is also one key element to reduce emissions. So what is, what is to your view, the plan of the Biden administration there? Thank you for that. Gina. Actually, I'm gonna to defer to Andrew on the first part. Um, that, that was certainly something he was way more involved in than I was. So go ahead, Andrew. Um, well, that's probably also politically smart of Gina as well, because this is, <laughs> this is delicate territory. Um, look, we should not expect uh, suddenly there'd be a great sort of, um, you know, um, kumbaya moment um, between the United States and China. Um, uh, the United States uh, and China have serious uh, problems, long-term trade issues, and Mr. Biden is as clear about that as, um, as his predecessor, Mr. Trump, is uh, on security issues and so on. Having said that, um, uh, there is no reason at all why climate should not be one of those issues that they can cooperate on very actively. Um, just because you have serious problems in other areas does not mean that you couldn't make progress. And one of the really uh, sort of encouraging things is that Mr. Xi Jinping's statement in um, the United Nations in September that they would uh, go to net zero by 2060 we tend to look at that as, my goodness, what a signaling method, uh, a signaling approach that is internationally. It's been an incredible thing. I mean, within you know a month, Japan had followed suit, and Korea had, uh, you know, and as you know, we now have over a hundred company countries that have said they will go to net zero, and seventy of them are, have actually given dates and so on. So it's a remarkable signaling, but in addition to that, it's signaling to the domestic market as well that something serious is going on, even as it applies to the Belt and Road. Um, last week, um, China announced the creation of a Green Belt and Road uh, Institute. Um, they are now open, partly because they're hosting the Biodiversity Convention, they're opening to discuss commodity trade. We've just written an important um, uh, paper on the greening of, commodity, of China's commodity trade, what they could do at, re at the request of the Chinese government. So there's some quite encouraging things, still with a long, long way to go. The Biden administration could play a very helpful role on the issue of international finance. International finance, public finance is a real failing issue. As you've said before today, Pascal and Susan, there's been an amazing progress on financial reform in Europe, in, uh, even in China, by the way. But on the public finance side, we're, we're, we're quite frankly, we're falling behind. Um, Look at the China's um, foreign investment. Look at the United States now coming back into the Green Climate Fund, influencing the World Bank and the regional banks, um, supporting the JEF, supporting the Adaptation Fund. These are areas that actually they and China could discuss pretty helpfully, I think. So, so uh, I think the door will be open, but don't expect you know um, it to apply to all sectors. Thank you, Gina. Can I just add on to that, the, the, just a recognition of the work that the EU did um, to actually work with China in the absence of the U.S. in any of these discussions, because it was incredibly commendable. And as Andrew indicated, it was, a, it was an excellent thing. You know, I, unless I'm mistaken, when I was in the Obama administration, we did a lot of work with China. And it wasn't because we got along on everything. Um, it was because it was a clear recognition that there were areas of, of mutual interest where we could really work together. And I, I, I believe that China is very interested in, in being, uh, continuing to be a positive force on, on, uh, on greenhouse gas emissions. And I think Andrew's right. Raising the Belt and Road Initiative themselves is a really smart and elegant move, frankly, because they know that the rest of us are gonna be knocking on the door about wh where this money is going and to what. Because the one thing I think both China and the US and, and India and, and others are, are clearly recognizing and the EU does, is that we have to recognize that we don't just have to take care of ourselves, that we have an outsized influence and have had for years on on other countries and their ability to grow and so there is a lot of recognition that we have a lot of work to do to make up ground over the past four years but clearly to make up ground through our history 
of finding clever places to put our pollution and not confining ourselves to, to the kind of uh, values that we, we hold dear. And so I, I think we have a lot of work to do, but we also also recognize that we have a lot of uh, um, we have a lot of apologizing to do about the past four years, and we will go into this with humble recognition that the EU stepped up considerably at a time when leadership was necessary. And I can't thank you enough for that. Yeah. Well, th thank you, thank you for that. I mean, it's it's hard not to make it as a conclusion because that's the <laughs> it's very nice uh, words uh, for us uh, and. Uh, you said that you are living uh, now uh, very exciting uh, times, but uh, we are as well, because the, uh, as you know, uh, the European Union, the Europeans, uh, France, Germany and others uh, were usually attacked by uh, the President Trump. So we are very happy to be able now to restart it on a very good path. Uh, what is, to my view, key between the two uh, sides of the Atlantic to cooperate with the same goal. That's the very first time we have the same goal regarding climate, the same agenda, the same wording. I mean, uh, green finance, green tra uh, just transition, and so on. So we are talking exactly about the same thing. So that's a very, very uh, exciting as well from our side. And I will be very happy to conclude on this. Um, of course, that's just a starting point. And I will be very happy as chair of the European Committee of the European Parliament and together with my colleagues to work with the US Congress, uh, with the, the, the executive arm as well, of course, to, to keep on uh, pu pu pulling the, the, putting the, the, the ball forward uh, in order to, uh, to meet uh, the goals uh, we have set uh, each other. So thank you for that. Thank you very much uh, to the uh, ESSEC team for organizing uh, this meeting. Thank you, uh, Suzanne, Andrew, uh, Gina, and, and Sedomir. Uh, thank you, especially to Sedomir, because now it's 1, uh, 1 a.m. <laughs> so uh, you can go to bed right now. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, happy to uh, uh, then uh, just uh, as a, a reminder, there will be a video made out of this uh, webinar that will be circulated all over the, the, the various channels. So thank you for that. Uh, see you soon for another climate talk uh, organized by the SIT Business School. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.